And on that note, I will ask uh, Corey to essentially take it away. Um, sure. I, I think maybe the best thing to do is to start by uh, asking each of you to just say a word or two about uh, your backgrounds and, and um, you know, your, you, you all have uh, some pretty remarkable achievements in information security. That would maybe be a, a nice way to, to get it kicked off. So let's start with Steve and I'll just go around on my grid here. Thanks, Corey. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Steve Crocker. I've been around for a considerable period of time. Helped uh, put the first nodes on the ARPANET and worked on protocols and, and uh, lots of stuff over time. Um, drifted into and out of security over time. Um, uh, chaired the Security Stability Advisory Committee for ICANN and was the first area director for security in the ITF, for example. Um, I'm now uh, retired from ICANN, been out of it for two and a half years, I guess. Uh, but uh, one little detail that has caught my attention is the super mess around who is, uh, what data is collected, and who may, who should have it uh, be able to be able to have access to it. And uh, the discussions have gone on for. Uh, not just a few years, but for a few decades without uh, clear-cut resolution, and then gotten more complicated with the GDPR, which has uh, triggered a kind of knee-jerk reaction. Uh, but uh, my feeling has been that if we tear it down to the, to the um, fundamentals and then build it back up, uh, we'll be in lots better shape. So the question is, what are you going to do with the data? Who wants it? Uh, there are uh, a lot of very legitimate uh, issues going in all all possible directions, uh, privacy directions, but also uh, a lot of people want some of the information published and made available. Uh, we have no mechanisms for being able to reconcile that. So I've been working pretty hard building a framework for uh, facilitating those kinds of conversations. Happy to have discussions with anybody about that, uh, but I think I've used up my introduction time here. You did use your introduction time, but I do want to add, because you're one of the most humble people I know, that you're one of the founders of the internet. You're one of the people responsible directly or and indirectly for AI moving forward in research in the 70s. You have done a lot of things, and I want to just say thank you. So thank you for also coming on the panel. Thank you, Gary. Um, okay, I'm going to call next on Karen. I just want to mention my internet is starting to go a little wonky, so I am uh, trying to, I might drop off and come back on using a, um, my mobile phone for tethering, given that my we got you. Mon my monopolistic carrier seems to be be hosing me at the worst possible moment. Uh, Karen, why don't you go next while I continue to mess with my internet connection here? Thank you, Corey, and thank you, Gadi, for inviting me to be on this show. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Elazari. I spell it with an E, K3R3N3. That's my hacker nickname. I'm a security analyst, researcher, and author from Tel Aviv, Israel. I've been in the security industry for more than 20 years. I started early. And when I first saw the film Hackers with Angelina Jolie in 95, that's when I really fell in love with the world of hackers and I've been fascinated with hackers ever since. I'm a researcher at Tel Aviv University. I'm also the founder of B-Sides Tel Aviv, which is Israel's largest security community event and the founder of Leading Cyber Ladies, which is a global network for women in cybersecurity. I'm very excited and very happy to be on this show. So thanks for having me. That's great. And I think I'm now on my mobile phone. You, you let me know if it starts looking terrible. Uh, Dimitri, why don't you come up next then? Thanks, Corey. Dimitri Alperovich here. I've also uh, been a veteran of the security industry, been in the industry for about 25 years now. Uh, most recently was the co-founder of CrowdStrike, uh, one of the leading cybersecurity firms. And um, a few months ago, retired from CrowdStrike to focus on the next uh, phase of my life, which will be in the policy space. And I'm in the process of launching what I'm calling a policy accelerator focused on both cybersecurity issues, but um, also broader geopolitical issues and specifically great power competition and how we um, try to address the challenges of countries like China, Russia, and others uh, that pose to us in the century. Well, glad to be with you. Sorry, Ron? Hey, hello, everybody. Hey, my name is Ron Gula. I am, I like to call myself the hardest working guy in cybersecurity right now. I invest in everything from small startups to series A, B, and uh, pre-IPO cyber companies. 
and try to really help out as many of the nonprofits, uh, some of the government stuff like Dimitri was talking about policy and whatnot, as well as just nonprofits like uh, Voting Works and Defending Digital Campaigns. Uh, I'm an avid science fiction reader. I think we're seeing a lot of science fiction you know, come before us. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of books are playing out. Looking forward to this conversation very much. Thank you. Great, and Caleb. Hi, Caleb Saima. I've been in the industry also for quite some time. Uh, early in my career was an entrepreneur and started a couple of cybersecurity companies. And then now just recently jumped over to the defensive side of the house. I'm a practitioner trying to defend companies from the attackers. That's great. You know, I thought I would start off with something very topical about um, the data that we're going to collect through uh, both contact tracing and exposure and notification. And um, what maybe some of the unexpected consequences of that might be. I was thinking, you know, we, we have all these different models for protecting privacy, like uh, decentralized collection, like we're seeing with the Apple Google API. But we've also seen that um, the uh, that identity thieves and, and APTs are endlessly inventive in ways of, of reusing data. Now, I think of a, an attack where someone merged um, anonymized prescribing data from the NHS that that's just had the time and the date and the doctor and the hospital and the substance, but not the person who was dispensed to. And then that was merged with a leaked uh, taxi cab fleet data set that could just figure out like, oh, every time this person goes to the hospital, someone writes a prescription for this antipsychotic med. Now I know who's taking the antipsychotic med. Thinking about things like maybe a, a bunch of uh, a, a vulnerability in iOS or Android that allows people to pull data off of devices that is decentralized or raids on big centralized repositories like we see being mooted in the UK and being built in, in uh, some Asian countries. Can you think of, of unexpected ways those might be combined with other sources or used uh, in, uh, in, in both identity theft attacks and industrial espionage and then uh, I guess nation state on nation state attacks as well? Well, I'll go first. I mean, there's always unexpected ways to pull data together. I think there was a report or at least a university study that said, just given the sex and the birth date and the zip code, they can triangulate pretty much who that is and with like a 75% accuracy. So you never know who has your data and who's selling your data. Um, it's very, very difficult for people to understand kind of what's out there. So the potential unintended consequences are just, are just amazing. Um, the average person who has, what, 100 apps on their phone, every one of those apps is collecting a random amount of information. If you look at companies that uh, are in this business, for example, uh, Xmode, uh, they're the ones behind some of these interesting COVID uh, maps where you saw people come coming from spring break going to um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Louisiana and whatnot for, uh, for, the, for the parties and whatnot. I, I mean, they have everything from GPS to the Wi-Fi to the speed of where you're going. And uh, there's just a ton of data uh, to analyze that. Uh, now, the one saving grace is if you're going to do that kind of data in bulk, you're talking about petabytes a day. So it's not the kind of thing where you're going to download a spreadsheet and like get, you know, all the COVID history for the United States. But, uh, but the data is out there. Right. I would agree with Rong. You know, we have to keep things in perspective right now. We have a global economy that's shut down. Millions are unemployed. Thousands are dying every day. We need to get back. And operational, the only way we're going to do that, according to the experts, is with testing and contact tracing. So we have to figure this out. And even if uh, we have to compromise our privacy for a limited period of time, I think that's a trade-off worth making, given the stakes that we face today. Um, now, we need to make sure that we don't overdo it and that once we're past this crisis, that we can actually shut down this capability and it doesn't become a thing that lives with us for decades to come. But I do think when you look at some of the technical proposals that are out there, particularly the Google and Apple proposal um, that has been implemented right now, they're very reasonable. A decentralized model that's opt-in and uh, you kind of have to approve for your contact history to be shared with someone is the right way to go. Um, it combines the right trade-offs of enabling us to solve this public health emergency, but at the same time, protecting us from authoritarian regimes that might use this uh, in various countries uh, to do us harm. Uh, Karen. Yeah, so I want to present two potential end games for this. One is here in Israel, about two months ago, the Israeli security services started using 
uh, location-based information which, uh, and capabilities, which were originally counter-terrorism capabilities that have started to being used for, for actually finding confirmed patients and notifying people that they might have been exposed to the coronavirus. Now, according to the data they just presented to the Israeli Knesset, the Israeli parliament this week, more than a third of the confirmed patients were found this way. So about 5,000 people were discovered using this technique. And it was allowed using emergency regulations. Now, even though the Supreme Court in Israel has now tried to kind of stop this usage of this very invasive counter-terrorism counter surveillance capability on Israeli citizens, what has happened is that the Israeli Knesset is acting to legislate this in about two weeks' time to make this part of our legal system. So this is one end game here, which is whatever we give up now is probably going to be gone for good. So whatever we allow right now is probably going to be with us even, you know, six years down the line or 10 years down the line, maybe with future regimes as well, because we all know, at least in Israel, there is nothing more uh, permanent than temporary uh, emergency regulations that have been turned into law. This is something that we've seen happen in Israel as well. So that's one potential end game. The other, which I think is really interesting, something I just saw recently on Twitter as a poll, and think about it yourselves, would you agree to run contact tracing applications on your phones if you are rewarded with cryptocurrencies for your participation in basically a massive uh, surveillance program? And at least 50% of the people I saw respond to this uh, Twitter poll responded in the affirmative. Maybe they'd like to see the privacy policy for that. Maybe they'll question, okay, is this state run or internationally run? But once you bring in the incentives and people will start bringing in incentives for people to use the contact tracing capabilities, we're gonna see a very different end game uh, for that, I believe. So these are some two um, interesting scenarios. One of them is very realistic happening in, here in Israel and the other is perhaps down the line. It's fascinating. I, I want to maybe add a little gloss to this and see if anyone else wants to jump in, which is that uh, I, I, it seems to me like this is unlikely to be the last serious public health challenge or public safety challenge we're going to face. A lot of times, obviously, with climate change, we have both the risk of increased zoonotic epidemics, if not pandemics, as, as animals seek new habitats where they don't have predators or where there's no immunity, but also floods, fires, and so on. And it seems like one of the potential downstream consequences of breaches arising from this or the permanentization of this, right? Where this, this gets repurposed to, you know, I don't know, find people who are cooking meth or, or whatever, is that the, the next time the crisis comes, you're gonna see a lot of people going, no, I, I don't wanna install the app. I'll leave my phone at home. I'm gonna ignore public health advice. And this was, this was a concern that was raised a lot in Pakistan when the uh, CIA pretended to be um, vaccination squad going from door to door and used that to find Osama bin Laden. And then afterwards, actual people who do public health and vaccination in Pakistan were, were facing violence and threats. And it took a, it, it really hurt vaccination in Pakistan as a result. Is there, is there a possibility of burning the long-term trust that we'll need for other things if, if there is a breach? And if so, do we, is there a, is there an unintended consequence that, that keeps you up at night about how this might become a, uh, uh, how, how the, this data may be merged with another data set or extracted non-consensually or saved when it's not supposed to be saved or what have you uh, that, that might give rise to that? Well, as, as Dimitri said, the decentralization is one of the best protection against a centralization of some massive hack, you know, either being used um, by hackers or, or, the, or a nefarious government. And um, the government has not had a good track record of keeping secrets secret on the internet, but not, you know, not a lot of other people have to as well. So I'm all for decentralization. So to ask just a stupid question here, sure. but don't carriers have all of this data and more in a centralized place? They so, have a lot of it, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, and there's, just, no, there's never been a breach there. We haven't seen anything. No one talks about privacy there. Why do we need this app when carriers have all of it? So well, it's not, it's not as accurate, right? So you want, you want to understand if someone is within close proximity to someone else, not if they're within 100 feet of them. Yeah, Karen? That's exactly the question that was asked by many people here in Israel. Why do we need the security authorities to utilize extra capabilities that were originally designed for counterterrorism? And the responses have been that the counterterrorism surveillance uh, 
capabilities are much more fine-tuned, they are much more detailed, they can identify people allegedly within structures, they can understand proximity to a much more granular, granular level. So this is not just location information from the cellular you know, base stations or even from the cellular company's backbone and all of their data sets that they do have large data sets of information about the movements of people. This is actually more advanced capabilities. At least that's what was, that, that is what is being used here in Israel. And again, the claim, which is, I think, pretty significant, is that they identified more than 5,000 patients using this, more than a third of the overall number of patients that were, that were identified in Israel. So, you know, uh, you can't argue with that kind of success metrics, at least when not when it's presented to legislators. Uh, so th these are not just the information that the cellular companies already have. And if I may build on that, uh, Corey, you know, yes, people have started leaving their phones at home. When they left their home, they moved around when they were not supposed to, so they left their phones at home. So then other types of surveillance capabilities come into play, whether it's uh, cameras, whether it's, of course, police officers on the streets. And just uh, from last week, uh, our prime minister suggested perhaps every child should have a sensor inputted into them that will alert if uh, that child comes into close proximity with another child. So that's, you know, he kind of based it, I guess, on the idea of the proximity sensors you might have in your car if you're backing into something. And a lot of people have responded that that sounds really crazy and really out there, but it has been, you know, he said it. So now that's on the table as well. And, you know, we might see that, that, that science fiction becoming a reality. We might see it in some countries where they'll use things that are not just phone, um, you know, phone capabilities, but actually other types of capabilities. And more importantly, the combination of many na national capabilities with private capabilities, whether it's from the phone companies or Google and Apple, et cetera, with national level surveillance capabilities. And that's so, like the cyberpunk future. Karen, I don't quite understand. So did they push an implant, perhaps an NSO implant to everyone, uh, everyone's phone? <laughs> I really can't answer that. I really can't answer that. Uh, but the, the, the claim that has been made is that this is a more advanced capability uh, that's more granular, and it's not right. just the location information that the cellular companies already have. So, I mean, at least uh, some technical detail maybe I can, I can provide uh, is that when T-Mobile and the other major U.S. carriers were caught, and, and Caleb, to your point, this wasn't a breach, but this was a, a, a release of data, an, an unpermitted release of data, that they were caught selling data to so-called marketing companies without any checks and balances. And that data was being sold on to bounty hunters, to stalkers, right? You could go and you could buy as a stalker, you could find out where your, your target was and so on. Um, that they were both using cell tower data and also 911 location data, which is where the baseband radio pings the location sensors in the device, including the GPS, but also pulls down things like um, triangulation based on nearby Wi-Fi and so on to, to, to get a finer grained location. And also just to, as a factual matter, we, I know of at least one major carrier's breach, which was the, the Belgian national carrier breached all of its location data and that data set was the basis of a really important um, uh, de-identification and re-identification paper. So, you know, uh, Corey, oh, sorry, I cut you off, go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead, Gadi, I was gonna call. No, 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 you go ahead. No, no, I was literally just saying, Gadi, you have a question, so. <laughs> so, um, actually, if we're talking about providers, I would like to kind of pull on Steve here. Uh, he kind of started the whole thing, and I would like to add also that this is a great question for the panel as looking back to, I mean, there have been various things happening with providers in the States and around the world, but looking back to one of these things that I thought personally was okay within the knowledge that I had was, for example, the big kerfuffle, I love the word kerfuffle, a few years ago around the AT&T, uh, I don't remember what they called it, a uh, room where the FBI or whoever could come and tap in. And thinking about that from an operational perspective, if somebody wanted to tap in, and this happened before, I remember in Nana when somebody stepped up against the FBI and said, you guys came in and insisted putting a hub in, to my systems and it dropped the entire ISP down and I couldn't communicate anymore. So having a room that allows for taps makes sense. Where is the line really between allowing for things that need to happen and protecting people um, from a privacy perspective? But Steve, I think that uh, you're perfectly suited to you know, take us in this direction. You're muted, Steve. I love Zoom. Yeah. No, I'm not. Um, <laughs> so one of the things that I always gravitate toward is, are there any hard and fast principles that you could um, uh, try to 
articulate. Is there a is there some sort of absolute basis for privacy? And uh, the sad fact, which we all live with, is is no. The only thing that uh, at least in the current state of technology that you have complete control over is what's in your head. But the minute you do anything that leaves your head, whether you speak or move or uh, act in any way, then you're interacting with the environment, you're interacting with other people, you're interacting with systems, and it's a shared experience of one sort or another. Uh, and so that information is no longer, uh, no matter how strongly you try to assert it, yours alone, it belongs in a more complicated uh, sort of joint ownership, if you will. Another question, and, and it's obviously sensitive information. Uh, the question is who gets to see it and how is it exploited? So we have a very, very complicated hierarchy or, or uh, it's not just a simple hierarchy, but a whole texture of, of the class of information and, and who should have access to it. And we don't have very well defined and well articulated structures for dealing with that. Um, and of course, we just have a lot of opportunism on the government and, and uh, uh, commercial enterprises and hackers and so forth, uh, taking advantage of it for their particular purpose at that particular time. So one of the things that I think we need to do is develop a, um, uh, a kind of vocabulary and, and uh, structure for dealing with the classes of information that are out there uh, there's no escaping that that information is there, whether it's the carriers or whether it's the surveillance uh, uh, mechanisms or the cameras on the street. Uh, uh, you, can't, you can't wish it away. Uh, in some sense, you're back in the small village where everybody knew everybody else's business. Um, and we've just scaled that up. And with technology, we can sort of encompass that. So instead of a thousand people who know everybody's business, we've got um, billions that we have complete control over. So one of the things that I'm interested in from this perspective of security economics and economics more broadly is uh, the idea of the Ulysses Pact, which is where you make an irrevocable pact prior to taking some action that binds you at a future date. You know, if you've ever gone on a diet and thrown away the Oreos, this is a, a, a Ulysses Pact, but also like if you stick a free software license to a GPL or, or even a Creative Commons licenses, which are irrevocable on, on material, then subsequent to that, you know, if your shareholders say, look, we, we've decided you're not worth uh, investing and we're going to sell you off to another company, but they'll only buy you if your code is proprietary, you can throw up your hands and say, I'm sorry, I've made an irrevocable grant, so I, I, can't, I can't change my mind on that. Can we think of Ulysses Pacts that would make the extraordinary measures that we take to control the pandemic uh, short-lived uh, or, or bounded in ways that would not allow them to readily be repurposed as a, a permanent sort of post 9 11 style surveillance apparatus? Let me yes. Just, Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, yeah, let me just comment on that. Um, so that sounds fine, except that Having done this exercise on the so-called short term, even if you have absolute ironclad things, the idea that you can do that is not going to go away. And uh, that's going to be part of the vocabulary going forward. So um, you might have short, in, in the extreme, you know, the best scenario is that you're going to have short term success with these Ulysses Pact and our children will grow up in a world in which that's uh, quaint. Hmm. So you don't, you, you, Steve, it sounds like you think that this is prefigured. I guess I would ask, like, in light of that, why do you think it is that um, we had telescopes for a long time, and it's really hard to detect whether someone's looking through your bedroom window with a telescope, but we never had an epidemic that we knew of, of bedroom window telescopes buying? Interesting question. Um... I don't think there's a whole lot you learn by looking through bedroom windows, particularly if people close their windows and uh, uh, probably just have not risen to the level where it's a, a sort of big problem. Hmm. Hmm. A, a telescope's a great example, but I can only look at maybe my five neighbors. You know, I can't look at a thousand people or 10,000 people on the, uh, on the internet using cyber techniques, if not a lot more. Well, I mean, satellite telescopes, if you're a person of interest, I would imagine, then it would become a problem. 
Right. I guess I'm wondering, I, it sounds like, um, like a, if not a council of despair, then kind of a, a, a hard technological deterministic perspective that a thing that is possible will be done. And it feels like there are a lot of things that are possible that we don't do anymore, maybe because we figured out how to do even worse things. But like, there aren't a lot of Iron Maidens in operation. The guillotine seems like a thing of the past. I mean, we're still hurting people in terrible ways. But, you know, thumb screws don't get used and, uh, and so on, right? Like, like, we have, in fact, put away a lot of things that were once uh, a commonplace. People don't ingest mercury for medical purposes anymore. Um, I think we just ingest bleach now. Yeah. yeah, we ingest bleach. This is true. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, Corey, I'm not, I'm not sure what your question is, right? So you want to have... Sorry, go ahead. I, I, I was, I mean, maybe I, I'll take a stab at rephrasing it. So, you know, I, I view this as we're citizens uh, of our countries, and I think we're, most of us are not thrilled with the response from our local governments, our state governments, and our federal governments. And there's a complete lack of distrust, not only with that chain, but with some of the scientific community and perhaps even some of the media. Mm -hmm. So I am all for making some of these bargains like you want to talk about, make, you know, make some of these agreements up front. But you're talking about completely tearing down, you know, some of those institutions so we can get those trust back. And that's, that's not going to happen overnight. Let me add uh, complexity to this. Um, we're, we're obviously concerned here with uh, an inappropriate, I'll just say, use of data that's been collected. But we have another major uh, effect that we've been living with uh, in big time, which is fake news. That is... Um, you know, suppose somebody says, well, I've collected all this information and you have been in the following place. And you say, no, I haven't. And they say, well, we've collected it. We know you have. So how do you know the, the truth of that information as opposed to whether or not it's been inappropriately uh, uh, exploited? Well, I guess you would know if you've been in the place, but I guess how would a third party know whether the data was, was accurate? Is that right? Or, I mean, you would know if someone said, well, I, I see that you were in Tokyo last week and you weren't in Tokyo last week, you could with a high degree of confidence say that the data was incorrect, right? Yeah, now I might have a, a, a pretty strong evidence that I wasn't in Tokyo, but I would not have equally strong evidence that I wasn't uh, two blocks away from my house interacting with somebody. Uh, this, or, again, if I may interject, this is a scenario that's actually already happened here in Israel. So some people have been receiving text messages alarming them that they have been in the close proximity with a confirmed patient and that they must now go to 14 days quarantine. And these people are like, well, I didn't go down that street on that day. And now they have to call the authorities and try and have a conversation trying to provide evidence, whether it's technical evidence or otherwise, that the, whatever location information had correlated them to be potentially COVID carriers now, they have to kind of prove their innocence rather than the other way around. So this is not uh, so much of a theoretical scenario, it's already happening. And I think with more contact tracing applications and tools, we're gonna see more of this. And it uh, definitely can be a little bit dark and bleak if you consider the possibilities for abuse of such a system. Well, so far we've been talking about location data. I mean, it's important to understand that for contact tracing, you actually don't need location data. All you need to know is that you've been in proximity with someone else. Where you are in proximity to that person is actually relevant for contact tracing, right? So that's why when you've seen the uh, efforts from Google and Apple, they're focused on Bluetooth interactions between phones as opposed to actually tracking GPS data because that's actually what's most relevant uh, for this um, disease and you know in their proposals they're keeping the data on the phone only with your confirmation um, will that data be shared with anyone and you can turn it off so that it's not being tracked so I think that's probably the best trade-off we can have in the situation where um, you know people are voluntarily opting into the system they can turn it off once it's no longer required and the data will no longer be collected and it's anonymized so you don't actually know um, whose phone you were uh, in proximity with but if everyone's sort of uploading that information, then you can match the two anonymous IDs together. I just want to make a small uh, factual distinction here. For, in a public health context, what you just described is actually exposure notification and, and contact tracing, which is often used synonymously. Public health experts are getting increasingly stroppy about calling uh, exposure notification uh, contact tracing because contact tracing is a thing that we actually have a lot of experience with and we know 
when it works and how it works. We don't know, we, exposure notification is a relatively new thing. We don't know if it's equivalent to it. And there's a lot of skepticism on the public health side that you can replace the extremely high touch face-to-face -face business of contact tracing, which involves doing things like going up to someone and saying, you know, you were on the street, do you remember who you saw? What were you doing at the time? What were they doing at the time? And building a trust relationship between a subject and an interviewer. It's the kind of thing that required, they did a 750,000 contact tracing interviews in China, uh, in Wuhan rather, uh, during the, the exposure response, the, the epidemic response there. So I, it, it is important to note that those aren't the same thing and that the contact tracing is actually super location based. Uh, and it's how we fought Ebola and, and a bunch of other things. Um, I, I do want to dig into this trust question. So you talked about fake news, you talked about non-compliance, and you talked about uh, having to convince your government that you are not claiming that you weren't in an infectious street because it's true and not because you don't want to have your freedom of motion limited. There's been a lot of talk about tech and trust. Uh, you have uh, some people who believe that, for example, the rise of conspiracism is down to the ability of big tech to make us not trust official news sources and others who say big tech finds people who don't trust authorities for whatever reason and feeds them alternate narratives but it's not the thing that weakens their trust the thing that weakens their trust is something else do you folks take a view on it do you have examples of technologies that actually do improve trust uh or or you know and back to that question during my presentation you know drm for personal information does you no good if you tell a secret to someone who turns out to be untrustworthy all the DRM in the world doesn't help you. I have a, I have a somewhat old and very humble example of uh, increasing trust. Um, when uh, FedEx started making available the tracking of packages, uh, uh, it greatly increased the trust of the delivery process compared with, say, the U.S. Postal Service. Hmm. Um, and uh, we just all gravitated toward trusting that without any, well, thinking about it. But the effect was really quite quite spectacular in my view. Uh, prior to that, you'd mail something, you'd have no idea whether it was going to get there or not. And if you tried to find out, you, were, you didn't have any good way of doing that. I, I actually was sitting next to a senior postal official employee on an airplane uh, a few decades ago now and trying to explain this concept to him. And he said, I can, I can find out where a package is. Well, he's sitting at the headquarters <laughs> and so forth. And I happened to have some screenshots of FedEx tracking that I was using in talks I was giving. So I opened up my laptop and showed it to him. And the expression on his face was something to behold. Yeah, Steve, can I ask you to clarify whether you think the tracking was the thing that built the trust or tracking that turned out to be accurate? Well, of course. I mean, <laughs> if it had been inaccurate, then it wouldn't, wouldn't have uh, uh, been useful at all. No, the fact that it was there and that uh, you could tell that it was accurate um, and that it was, it was t tied into the system in a way that, uh, uh, you know, and there weren't any stories about how it had been um, undermined or used to convey uh, uh, false information. I mean, the intent was to it was to convey accurate information. And that matched the experience almost all the time, I would say. I'm sure there were glitches, but right. uh, not in a way that, that undermined the trust to all that. So I thought that was a very strong move in which the technology improved trust, as it were. Uh, Gadi, I think you wanted to say something? Yeah, I actually wanted to try and get Dimitri to comment in on this from a different perspective, but a similar theoretical issue around, uh, I don't want to go too far down this path, but attribution not necessarily reaching it, but what you do with it, how it works around the same kind of problem, if that makes sense to you, Dimitri. If not, we can move on. Attribution of cyber attacks or attribution of COVID? You know what? You tell me. <laughs> well, look, I've, I've always been believing in attribution. Um, I think that in, in the cyber context, certainly, but in others as well, uh, it's critical for us to understand the source of threats, uh, whether man-made or not. Well, I will actually <laughs> allow myself, because you're my friend, to cut you off and say, didn't you personally have issues around trust with this? I mean, say you reached attribution. It yeah. almost seems like attribution is no longer about facts, whether it's possible or not. I believe it is. You believe it is. Let's move on from that. Um, but rather, you, say you reach the attribution. Does it even matter? How do you establish trust around um, such an incident? And does it even matter? Well, it depends on um, who is the recipient of that data, right? So, you know, if this is, of course, being presented in a criminal prosecution, 
then you have to prove it uh, with facts beyond a reasonable doubt to, to a jury of your peers, at least in the United States. So that's a very different level standard from publishing a blog and, and accusing someone. Um, you know, the US government is now doing attribution, what seems like every single week against nation state actors. They never publish um, their evidence. Um, even when they do indictments, it's mostly accusatory indictments, even though they provide a lot of detail who the person is, they never say how they, they discovered it. Um, presumably they would should those people, um, at least from a nation state perspective, actually be brought into a court of law. Um, but um, it, it's an interesting question that you raise, Gotti, because the, the audience matters. And I would argue that a lot of the attribution pronouncements that are made by governments are mostly for their domestic audience um, to give people information about what is going on so that they can then have credibility to take policies against uh, various countries. So, you know, the original indictments uh, back in 2014 against five PLA officers by the Justice Department really, if you sort of trace it through, led to the trade war um, that has now been waged against China or uh, in the Trump administration and even measures that the Obama administration was taking at the very end. And, and this is really interesting. You mentioned trade war, and that's where I kind of would step out, move it back to Corey. Um, a lot of this trust that's being tr uh, tried to be, um, that people try to establish, we've seen how effective, as Karen mentioned a little bit earlier, going and actually doing something such as using security mechanisms for COVID has proven effective, and that scares a lot of people as it should. Uh, that said, once this legislation is out there, we have seen many cases, as also mentioned earlier, where it just doesn't go away. But that's not the only thing. Looking at two types of legislations, one of them is GDPR, which I don't see it mentioned a lot, but is effectively, in my view, if not, uh, we need it and, it's, it and there are issues with it and it's great and I support it, but GDPR is effectively trade war. You have to choose geopolitically, kind of like you usually say around cybersecurity, who you support, what legislation or regulation you want to support around that. And then in China, forgive me for forgetting if it was 2017 or 18, but I think it was June when they passed legislation, which I don't know too much about, which forced foreign companies to uh, disclose passwords, encryption keys, give them control in a way. Um, so effectively, if somebody wants to work in China, they have to give away the privacy of, for example, American citizens to a degree. So it's, it's funny to me how these things kind of collide. On the one hand, you want to do something that's very effective. On the other hand, what's going to happen next and what does it hurt? And kind of bringing it down to my point, I would say that this collision is not always straightforward. And one thing that worries me, and we can see this around what Steve said around uh, who he is in privacy, is that we really want to have privacy out there. But the more we hurt the security controls that help us to maintain security, the less we're able to actually create privacy. And that's kind of where it comes together for me. And if we look to Ron, for example, when he has to invest, I see a lot of investors now looking at security before they put money in. It's becoming part of the daily processes. CEOs can get fired. Um, so with security rising, we start worrying about privacy. And with privacy rising, security goes down because it's not allowed. And it's kind of a big issue that I kind of see out there. I, I want to correct one, one thing you said, Gadi, because you're my friend. So GDPR, as it's written, is actually not a trade war. If you look at the actual language of the law, not necessarily how it's been interpreted by others, it is designed to facilitate data transfers out of Europe and regulate how it's done. So sort of the ostensible purpose of it is to actually enable people to take personal data out of Europe and transfer it to other countries and making sure that those safeguards persist. Now it's turned into a data localization situation, even though the law specifically is, is not about data localization, but companies in Europe in particular have used it to say, you shall not take my data out of Europe. I appreciate that correction. Thank you. Do, do any of you folks want to say anything about the GDPR? I, I have a few thoughts as well, but I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to weigh in here. I have yeah, something I'll, to say I'll, about trust, ahead, if Carrie. I may. Yeah, go. Well, yes, please. Well, Adrian uh, wrote in the chat that transparency is often a good way to increase trust. And I don't disagree. However, here's a counterpoint. We usually demand transparency when we don't trust someone or something. Mm -hmm. In effect, trust is sometimes the willingness to go ahead with something that you don't have full transparency into mm -hmm. it. So trust and transparency shouldn't be synonymous. And in the same, you know, the same breath, I would say that privacy and security, while always mentioned together in the same sentence, they're not, you know, might be, they might be related, but they're like dueling siblings and they demand different things from us. And they will be, we will have to you know, give up some things, and we are giving up some things in the interest of either privacy or security. And now trust is coming into that, you know, 
it's coming onto that chopping table, I believe, in some cases. Mm. So that's uh, something I wanted to say, especially because I really enjoyed Adrian's comment in the chat. Yeah, let's let's dig into trust a little more and, and the role of tech and trust. How do we feel about the proposition, you know, either phrased, phrased positively by the tech giants or negatively by their critics? The tech giants say, we can, with enough data, we can um, convince anyone to buy your product. And their critics say, with enough data, big tech can make anyone believe the earth is flat or that coronavirus is a 5G conspiracy. Do we think big tech is doing it? It sounds like a sales claim to me, and I'm usually pretty skeptical of sales claims. I think big tech is enabling it. I don't really imagine the big tech CEOs like pushing these things out there, pushing these policies out there. Every now and then you have examples like uh, the Reddit CEO went in and actually changed, uh, you know, somebody he disagreed with, changed actually what he said, you know, and that's a pretty egregious example. But I think for the most part, these guys are enabling things that they didn't really have any intention that they were enabling. Let me rephrase that a little. Do we think that big tech, if you say, find me the, using a automated A-B splitting and unsupervised machine learning, figure out which words I need to say to someone to make them think that the earth is flat, right? Or, or that they should go out and buy, you know, a, a, an exercise bike. Right, like, do we think that big tech can do it, or, or do we think that that's just what they claim, and their critics have latched onto their sales claims as evidence that big tech is an existential threat that is causing people to believe in conspiracies? I, I don't think they have enough data to do it for a specific person. I think they have enough data to do it for populations. I think the issue matters. I think it's a lot harder to convince people to exercise than to believe that the earth is flat. Unfortunately. Uh, you have to tie into the emotional heartstrings that all of us have uh, and our biases that we're born with and uh, are raised with. And, um, you know, there's lots of research pointing out that that's very, very effective. Getting us to do the right thing is often a lot harder to do. Hmm. Hmm. I, I will cop to being very skeptical of the, of the claim. I think that people may be primed to believe in conspiracies because they don't trust institutions because in many cases institutions are untrustworthy. I think, you know, if you if you pay close attention to like anti-vaxxer discourse, they know a lot about the Sackler family and Purdue Pharma and the opioid epidemic. And you know, their claim that we can't trust the FDA's uh, safety safety inspect or safety data about vaccines is bolstered by the FDA having really blown it on safety data on opioids. Um, and, and likewise, I think, you know, when people say the carriers can't be trusted with 5G, they tend to be, uh, even though I think they're completely wrong about 5G and cancer, they're right when they say, well, we don't think that, we think that if the carriers wanted to do something that wasn't very good, that their regulator would probably let them get away with it. Therefore, it has the aura of plausibility. And I think big tech helps you find people who are primed to believe it. But I don't think that A-B splitting helps you convince those people that 5G is a Chinese plot or giving them coronavirus or whatever. Yeah, I, I think it's actually really important to understand that people actually don't inherently distrust institutions. They may distrust certain facts, right? So, uh, you know, mm -hmm. there's all kinds of reports about the, the lack of trust in the media. But on the other hand, when you're picking up a newspaper and you're reading the sports column, no one actually uh, mistrusts that the Yankees went, won last night. No one is saying, well, that's fake news. I don't believe that. Everyone believes that certain things are happening. Uh, but when they read um, things like climate change stories or other things that um, disagree with their political views, that's when they say, oh, I don't trust it because where it's written. So I would like to kind of um, bring examples from the past. And I would like to, um, if um, relevant, I would like Caleb to kind of work on this. And then Steve, we have had a lot of attempts to create trust on the Internet. And earlier, Karen mentioned also something that... Uh, for a more American audience could be a little bit more sensitive. And I've looked for years for a way to say this without um, triggering people. When, you, when systems grow, <clears throat> we start uh, taking away rights I mean, or freedoms. I'm using these words um, on purpose right now because I don't have another alternative. And we have no other way of maintaining these systems. Maybe uh, the ideological answer would be, you know what, the system should die and be replaced, or maybe it should reach entropy at some level or whatever else. So I found a quote, which I truly appreciate and has kind of led me through my route around security. It's from Louis Mumford, who wrote one of the first, I think, big works on technology and philosophy. I believe it, uh, I forget the name right now. It was probably Techniques and Civilization. And the quote goes, the right to access every building in a city by a private motor car in an age when everyone possesses such a vehicle 
is actually the right to destroy the city. And as somebody who has been an operational guy for many years, how do I maintain my systems? How do I keep them up? And then how do I not hurt the rights of others to use these systems and if they have these rights? And what happened online was reputation systems. Whether it's Blacklist, the first one I, uh, I believe was uh, uh, by Paul Vixie and he got sued over that, right? We have a lot of uh, other types of reputation systems out there like sites such as Wave of Trust. Now we have uh, algorithms such as uh, systems based on blockchain. And I just wonder, when you try to build a security system, how do you take into consideration that scale issue versus other aspects, if you even do? And that's more of a product market fit or growth or getting into market, how you have to move fast and you don't even take this into consideration. That's what I would like take Caleb to say. And then if Steve can kind of step in on the reputation systems we have tried over the years. Man, I don't know, Gary. I don't know if I have a lot of opinion on that. <laughs> I'm going to have to pass it to you, Steve. You're, you're muted, Steve. So Steve, uh, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm in the same position. I um, have only recently started looking closely at reputation systems. Uh, I paid, I tried to pay no attention to them when they first came out. Um, uh, uh, the, only, the only thing that comes uh, to mind is uh, getting back to this business. So how do you trust the information is uh, how, what other mechanisms are there to verify the information? And so if you have a source that is lying to you, how quickly can you uh, check that it's lying to you? And uh, uh, I mean, the climate change is a good example that um, the, 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 the absolute um, proof that, that uh, you're being lied to is some number of decades or a hundred years from now, as opposed to right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that's kind of exceeds the, uh, the time frame for the feedback that it would be. Uh, so, whereas, you know, if the FedEx is lying to you, then you know the pack doesn't get there tomorrow. Um, so that's a much quicker cycle. That's a trivial example, obviously. Maybe a couple points on reputation is, you know, random thoughts is, you know, who, who drives the reputation? I think is probably pretty important. Um, you can either do it at such a wide scale where the numbers are big enough that reputation kind of balances itself out to be correct, I guess, or you have to have a small number of people who you trust as a core to build that reputation to say that is this reputation actually worthwhile? Because if you're not in either one of those two, I feel reputation can be gamed. And so then reputation, then what's the point? And then bringing it back to what Corey said, this and next week's show topic around fake news, somebody can, um, and I don't want in any way to dismiss any claims or anything that happened to anybody um, or to dismiss anything that actually happened uh, in the world. It's very easy now to destroy people's careers entirely by moral outrage on Twitter. So is trust or reputation actually based on anything or are we still you know, humans at the end of this? How do we create something that works for systems that are complex with humans? Look, I think I, you know, we, we try to address this with in, in truth seeking with things like the scientific method, right? Where we, we say, irrespective of the esteem that you are held in by your colleagues and your previous achievements, every claim you make from now on also has to be subjected to adversarial review by people who, who try to replicate your findings and, and hold your, um, and, and hold you to account, right? So the fact that you know, Watson gets a, gets a Nobel for the DNA molecule doesn't mean that when he makes eugenic claims, which he does all the time because he's a horrible eugenicist, that we, uh, that we just take them at face value. We don't say, oh, well, you're a Nobelist, therefore when you, when you make claims about, about uh, eugenics that you're right. Um, and, and, you know, it, it, that is a, the reason I think the method establishes that is that our instinct tells us to do otherwise, right? Our instinct tells us to uh, treat past, um, past good performance as a guarantee of good future performance. And there's always hidden information, right? There's hidden information about, about the things that you didn't see that abusers did to people who weren't allowed to speak out or the, the things people did when their youthful excess before they, before they became known for who they were, whether that's the founder of Banjo, this analytics company that did this huge deal with, with the state of Utah, 
to uh, monitor all the CCTV feeds and all the other data sources in the state, but w whose founder turns out to be an ex-neo-Nazi who once shot up a synagogue with some Klansmen, uh, or whether it's, it's um, you know, the, the untrusting trust, right? The author of the first compiler revealing that he's been putting backdoors in every Unix system ever since, uh, long before anyone knew that he was a famous guy who could be trusted, he was a puckish programmer working in a skunk works building time bombs into his compiler code. Um, and, and I think that, you know, it's hard to counter that human tendency to trust people who behave trustworthily. But, you know, this is whenever we see re reputation systems failing, that seems to be why they, why they do it, right? It's the eBay seller who does 100 good transactions for small dollar amounts in order to list 15 laptops that turn out to be boxes full of bricks, which the people don't uh, know because they also trust that when FedEx tells you that a box is on your way, that the thing that eBay told you was in the box is actually in the box. And so they all sit there patiently reloading their FedEx things until the box shows up and they open it up and discover that it's full of bricks and that eBay seller has disappeared. Corey, I'm absolutely so, horrified right now because you've just attacked the whole premise of this panel since we're all experts in certain things, but we're being asked to comment on other things that we're not experts in. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I would like to do the opposite of the reputation meter, and I want to do a troll meter instead. Uh -huh. So as opposed to being reputation on good, I want to build a reputation on people being trolls. So that way, when I see news links in social media, mm -hmm. if like 80% of them are from trolls, then I just ignore it. <laughs> it would be off the internet. What would I do? <laughs> right. Yeah. And I think that's easy to do, right? You could, as opposed to saying, oh, I trust you that you're good, I'd rather just say, oh, you're a known bad. And therefore, I can just not listen to you. I think the problem you'd have is that you'd lose almost every whistleblower. Because one, one of the hard facts, speaking as, an as someone who works for an organization that sometimes defends whistleblowers, is that whistleblowers tend to be pretty spiky people, right? Like, the, you know, we would like every whistleblower to be like an Ed Snowden, who just really believed in the mission, tried really hard, no one believed him, so he told the truth. Most whistleblowers are people who are like, happy to go along with doing whatever was terrible, but then they had an argument with their boss and got fired. And they're like, fine, retaliation. Well, the, the, the fact is the fact, right? The bad thing is the bad thing. We're better for knowing it, even if the person who said it has, has dirty hands. My, you know, my counter to that is that the whistleblower won't be uh, on Twitter. The whistle, like a true whistleblower will be whistleblowing via other means versus spouting off junk on Twitter. That's the that's probably the difference. And before we go into the Edward Snowden debate, because everybody here would have a very, 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 very strong opinion on the topic, um, I would like to ask, I think Karen actually posed a question a few times around uh, CPAP machines and people hacking them for COVID. And I was wondering uh, how that yeah. relates to everything we've been talking about. Well, I, I think this is a great story, actually. First of all, it shows you how hackers are sometimes breaking the law or breaking tech and specifically doing all the things that Corey talked about in the opening to this, to this show uh, with regards to uh, reverse engineering firmware. So there is a hacker out there right now who has this amazing project. It's called airbreak.dev, airbreak.dev. I believe the hacker's name is Trammell Hudson. And he's got this collaborative project to reverse engineer the firmware for CPAP machines. For those of you who don't know, CPAP machines are devices that people that have sleep apnea or dif uh, difficulties of breathing during their sleep. And they have these devices. And these devices are not as good as a ventilator in the fight against corona. However, due to the shortage in ventilators in many hospitals, the FDA and other uh, regulatory authorities and, and hospitals have started looking at how can they use other devices that are cheaper, that are perhaps more, more available. And they started using different types of devices. And what this guy is doing is really hacking the firmware to enable more capabilities from a piece of hardware that people might have in their homes that's easier, more accessible, cheaper, and he's not claiming this is a cure for anything, of course, but he is displaying this as proof of concept for what hackers can do with devices when, yes, they break the law, yes, they invalidate the warranty, yes, they break through the temper evident, uh, you know, plastic barriers or whatever they are. And this is actually happening right now. And I think biohackers right now are really having a moment where they're really doing all of these cool DIY projects and hacking projects. And it's not just working on, on cool hardware and coming up with, with solutions or at least trying to spark solutions. 
Uh, it's also with helping businesses that are being targeted by cyber attacks. So there's also voluntary hacker groups that are now helping businesses. There's something called the Cyber Threat Intelligence Alliance, which is a voluntary organization. So uh, this really proves to me that uh, like I famously once said, hackers are the immune system of the internet. We're now really seeing that come into force in a variety of ways. And I think we're always going to need those types of people that are invalidating warranties, that are breaking things, that are reverse engineering firmware, and that are actually maybe forcing some transparency uh, from the organizations that expect transparency from us. So that uh, to me gives me hope. I'm all for hardware hacking, but I think when it comes to the medical arena, we have to be extremely careful. There's a reason yeah. why we have very long certification process by FDA and other regulators, because this stuff can actually kill people. And when it comes to CPAP machines, there is a lot of controversial evidence on this because the problem is that the, um, the connection uh, into your mouth is not airtight. So you, you actually have a dangerous um, opportunity to spread the virus across the room and infect many other people with a CPAP machine because it's actually not a true ventilator. So I think this is a moment in the medical community in particular uh, in the medical device uh, space in particular, we need to be very, very careful to not promote solutions that are not certified and can actually uh, make things a lot worse. Hmm. Yeah, hey, so I, story I, there. Uh, I was just going to talk about the Maker's Mask project where people sure. were leveraging their 3D home printers to basically make N95 masks and they actually did get them certified. But they have a really interesting story because when they first came out, they were a victim of makers and people who were doing fraudulent phishing, fraudulent, whatever. So the actual live makers mass site was on virus total for a long time. And it just happened to have a friend of mine at Google who was like, hey, guess what I'm doing? I'm like, hey, guess what you're blocking? And I uh, was able to get that uh, removed and whatnot, which gets back to the whole fake news and who do you trust? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the FDA certification process is a really interesting one because for implants, not for CPAPs uh, or, or ventilators, but for implants, there was no certification until the 70s. And the FDA, when they began certification, they brought in a rule that said, we're going to grandfather in every device that currently exists. So you don't have to get your medical implant removed tomorrow because we decertified it. And we'll also grandfather anything that's substantially similar to an existing approved device so that you don't have to get recertified. And this loophole has swallowed the rule. Uh, There's a documentary two years ago called The Bleeding Edge that Kirby Dick put together that won a Peabody and a bunch of other awards that documents how almost every medical implant in the field today has never undergone FDA approval because it's similar to a device that's similar to a device that's similar to a device that's similar to a device that was grandfathered in in 1976. This is how you get things like vaginal mesh, metal on metal joint replacements that had uh, heavy metals in them that, that gave people permanent joint and brain damage uh, and so on and so on. And it does undermine this trust. Uh, I believe that the people who are doing the CPAP hacking, uh, what they did was they revealed that the CPAP could blow as well, uh, could suck as well as blow, right? That's the big difference between a CPAP and a ventilator. And what they also did was they said, uh, we don't think anyone should use this. What we think is that medical professionals who are able to evaluate this should know that this firmware mode exists and then evaluate it to decide what to do, which I think is a, I think that's a good approach. It may turn out to be, it may turn out, as you say, Dimitri, to be unsafe, right? But that, that I, as you say, also is a thing that medical professionals should make the call on. And I think what these hackers wanted to do was take that out of the hands of the manufacturer and put it in the hands of the, the doctors. And so do you, actually, think the, do you think the manufacturer can get sued if some hacker builds this device, someone dies from it, and then like goes and then they start to try to sue that person. Why didn't you protect your stuff from making this thing happen? This came up with Medtronic when people started uh, revealing defects uh, in Medtronic implants, where they showed that their implanted pacemakers and defibrillators had vulnerabilities that allowed remote parties to um, hack them wirelessly and deliver lethal shocks to people who had them implanted in their chests. And Medtronic's response was to put uh, firmware locks on that in theory stop people from modifying the firmware. In practice, those locks were actually overridden pretty quickly. And what it actually did was give Medtronic a legal weapon to sue people who revealed defects because if you had to bypass a firmware lock, uh, then you bypassed a copyright access control and you violated section 201 of the DMCA. So anyone who wants to give people lethal shocks can do the same research that those hackers could do. But the... Uh, but anyone who wants to do research to figure out whether the locks work can't. Uh, and so that, that I think is the worst of all worlds. No one ever sued Medtronic over it, 
I know when Dick Cheney got his Medtronic implant, his, his pace, uh, implanted defibrillator, he had the wireless interface turned off, which means that all of his uh, firmware updates involve a scalpel now. Well, uh, Corey, just to build on that, for the uh, listeners or viewers of the show that want to learn more about biohacking, I really recommend you check out Biohacking Village, which is part of the DEF CON security conference, and they have activities and information, and as well as We Heart Hackers, which is actually an FDA-sponsored uh, or FDA-supported initiative to bring biohackers to work with the FDA, to work with their regulation and, and their testing and their certification processes. So this could probably be a topic for another you know, future show, Gadi. I think biohacking is uh, enough mm -hmm. uh, of a topic that, you know, certainly in science fiction and this reality that could fill up a, a whole new show in of itself. Let's let's do some closing remarks here since we're out of time. Karen, did, did, that was that was a good close. But do you have anything else you want to add? Well, the like I said, the thing that gives me hope right now is that the people that are working to find solution and to look at how technology is changing our landscape are not just working for government agencies or even academic institutions, but that they are also people that are hackers, that are on maybe the outliers on the fringes of society, that are working together in a variety of ways. And actually, I think we have now a little bit more trust because we've all opened up our homes, at least one sliver of our homes, to people all over the world, which is something we didn't used to do, as hackers at least. So I'm very hopeful about that. I'm not wearing pants, but everything from this side up is good. Steve, <laughs> Steve did you want to go next? Uh, I am wearing pants, good man, uh, because I, uh, I I try to take these things seriously, and I worry. Never mind. Um, uh, this has been a fascinating discussion, actually, and, and it's it's uh, uh, pretty positive in my view. The depth of thought that is going into all of this. This is these are as I said. There's no trivial, simple solution to these things, and we're going to have to sort out. Uh, and build a much richer vocabulary that we can work with. And I'll just leave it at that. Uh, Caleb. Uh, no, not, no final thoughts on my end. All right. Uh, Dimitri. I'm good. You're good. And Ron. Yeah, we started to touch on it, but I don't think we really got there. I'm, I'm very concerned that we are putting a lot of apparatuses in place worldwide, at least in the, the five eyes, the free nation, so to speak, that are not going to go away. And I think it's going to take a while before we let uh, the politicians, the governments and whatnot, uh, you know, really sort of take that, that stuff back. E even to the point of, like, I'm happy we're locked down, I'm happy we're home, but, you know, what if next time it's just a slightly more bad flu and not something as serious as COVID? So I think we have a lot of questions that as a society we really need to uh, to answer. I'm just concerned we're going to be in this kind of mode for a much, much longer time than we need to be. Yeah, I, I'm concerned just that the second wave, that if this lockdown, that, that people's trust might be so eroded that a second wave doesn't have a successful lockdown and sm slides smoothly into a third and fourth and nth wave that nerfs our ability to make vaccines and so on you know, be through, through the ensuing chaos. And on that happy note, Gotti, I'll turn it back over to you. Keep washing your hands, everyone. Thank you very much. Appreciate and appreciate everybody coming on. I would like to say this has been an extremely interesting panel for me personally, and I think we can probably do a lot more in the future. I appreciate everybody sending in your questions. I'm sorry we didn't necessarily get to all of them. I would like to thank essentially everybody, Corey, for creating the show as well as taking us through um, is talk and the Q&A. I'd like to thank Steve, Karen, Ron, Dimitri, and Caleb for coming on. And uh, what I really like about this is that uh, we took it in many directions, but we also allowed ourselves to say, you know what, no comment on that. And we moved on. So I truly appreciate it. Next week, we have a panel with uh, actual experts on the topic of fake news. And we're not going to fall into the tropes of mentioning presidents or uh, politics or special specific TV stations or um, a specific country, which is what people usually just throw out. There is a trope when uh, somebody mentions the topic, we're going to have academics such as, um, and in academia, they call this uh, weaponized narrative, which I absolutely love. And uh, we're going to have the person who invented that. We're going to have people like uh, Grok, who are actually uh, working hard on countering these things, SJ Terp. We're going to have uh, um, some people from politics and policy, and they are actually going to talk in two panels about one, how does this affect policy and how does this affect society? And two, 
how do we uh, counter this? What are actual methodologies and techniques to counter all of this? And with that, thank you very much for coming in today. This was Essence of Wonder. Have a great day, evening, morning, wherever you are. Thank you.